Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host. And before we jump into this episode, I want to apologize for my kind of raspy voice. Unfortunately, living in Oklahoma, it's allergy season. And uh, unfortunately, it's hit me pretty hard. And so if you can make it through my voice, I promise you're going to love the guest. You're going to love what he's going to do. And he is going to transport you through time to the very history that we all love, a history that combines the Romans, ancient Britain, and naturally the Picts. It's not just a series about history. It's a series that actually takes you there. And without further ado, Alexander Isles, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for inviting me on, Nick. It's great to be here. For our subscribers today, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do? So I live in Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England, and I work as a tour guide. So I do guided walking tours, and I've done them for the last nine years. When I've done guided walking tours, I've learned about the region, discovered about the areas of the northeast, and I absolutely love it. So when you come to northern England, the majority of people, when they think of England, think of the southeast. They think of London. They think of maybe in the south, maybe even put into the southwest, Stonehenge. Uh, that sort of thing, go slightly further north and go to Stafford-upon-Avon, Shakespeare's birthplace, and look at all of those sort of things. But that's a very narrow view of England and also the British Isles, because, you know, when the, the whole United Kingdom, we've got England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and then obviously our neighbour, Southern Ireland. So there's a huge amount of history and heritage. And I wanted with the, the northeast of England to be able to show off an area that's got such a an amazing heritage and history and tell us stories of it. That's why I've uh, done guided tours and now I'm expanding into YouTube as well. And to my subscribers, don't forget to check out the links in the video description below. It's going to take you to all of the awesome work Alexander is doing to better educate people like me and you on the subjects that we all love, including bringing you to the history itself. And he's going to do that today as he takes us to none other than Hadrian's Wall. Hello to the followers and friends of the study of antiquities and the Middle Ages. My name is Alex Isles and welcome to Hedden on the Wall, where there is still a remaining section of Hadrian's Wall to see to this day. Now Hadrian's Wall is a captivating historical monument. It's been the subject of books, film, TV, archaeological research, and it has transformed a great deal of the modern day British Isles by dividing the British Isles into two for the first time ever and separating peoples from the Roman Empire and then also north of the wall where the tribes continue to evolve but within the influence of the Roman sphere. So it's amazing to see how this has had such a huge effect on history and today I'm going to do a short video to just to walk you through it. Now Hadrian's Wall, when it was originally constructed, was designed to be three meters wide and between four and a half meters and six meters high. It would have a ditch north of the wall, which you can just see barely to my right hand side here, just in the landscape. And then behind the wall, you would have two mounds called berms and in a ditch called a vallum. Alongside that, there was going to be every mile, a mile castle, a small little fort, which would have maybe between 10 and 40 soldiers within it. There would be the primary defense for the wall. And then between every mile castle, there would be two turrets, which would be watch posts to watch the wall and to see what was going on to the north. That was going relatively well until Emperor Hadrian got directly involved in the construction. And Hadrian himself fancied himself an architect and he thought what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to this wall and change and transform it. And so he added 16 forts into the wall, bringing thousands of troops from all over the Roman Empire and stationing them on this frontier. This had a huge effect because suddenly you have troops from all over the empire that have been recruited and they are generally from the non-citizen population. These are auxiliaries, people who have signed up for 25 years service for the hope of citizenship at the end of it. So these guys are recruited, they come to Northern Britain and they drastically change the demographics of the area, bringing cultures from as far away as Syria, Iraq, Germany and Spain to Northern Britain and becoming a part of the local people and the culture up here on the Roman frontier. 
Alongside that as well, the wall went straight through tribal land and generally people sometimes refer to the Britons as Celts. I don't necessarily like the word because it's like referring to the whole of Europe as Europeans. It's so broad it doesn't actually dig down into the minutiae and the details of these cultures. And so the people up here we generally refer to as Britons. They had their own cultures, their own dialects, their own languages, and there were regional differences as well, all throughout Northern Britain. So these peoples were suddenly separated from people on the other side of the wall. Lands that would have been within family use for centuries were suddenly split by this wall as well. And then suddenly, to get through the wall, you have to talk to these Roman invaders, to these people who have come in, have taken your land, and have transformed the way the world works all around you. And you either have a choice of Romanizing and becoming a part of their civilization or resisting. So it's amazing just to see how the war would have had a huge effect on those people as well. The other fact about the wall as well is that it was used nearly continuously with the forts, the mile castles, the turrets for 300 years. And then as Roman Britain started to fall apart as the Western Roman Empire fragmented, the senior command of Britain pulled out and went to the continent. But there were still a lot of soldiers and Romano-British people left in the country. And the, the military commanders of these small units of soldiers seemed to have become regional kings. They had become like um, local warlords. And the forts on Hadrian's Wall become their little castles where they would rule from. And then if they had ambitions, they might try and take over a nearby fort or bring together a load of people so they could make their own petty kingdoms. And we see that in the post-Roman period. One of the questions that get asked a lot, because I work as a tour guide, especially by North American customers, is why is there so little of the wall left today? And the reason why is after the Roman period, all of the wall here was left. It started to fall apart, it started to collapse, and on top of this as well, it was in the way. No longer was this a frontier of the Roman Empire, it was just a wall in fields. And these fields were open for the taking by whoever was the most ambitious, the most successful in warfare, or through diplomacy as well. And so because of that, the wall here started to be quarried and taken. The forts would be turned into local regional palaces or sometimes abandoned and just left. And then over time, they were then the wall forts and the wall stone here were used to build other buildings. So for instance, in the Dark Ages, both the Anglo-Saxons and the Britons used the stone to build churches. Following on from that into the Norman invasion, it was used to build castles throughout Northumberland. And then in the modern period, it's been used to build towns and villages, and it's been recycled into local buildings as well. So we're incredibly lucky that there's so much of the wall remaining today. And you can see here, you've got about a metre to a metre 20 of the wall standing. Whereas so much of the wall has been taken and been used in other constructions throughout the whole of the northeast of England and the northwest of England. So that's a little bit of an explanation as to why you can only see so little of the wall today. Now, there's so many other things I could tell you about Hadrian's Wall, so many other stories and things like that. But what I'll do now is we'll move into the interview with Nick and then he can ask me questions and hopefully from there we'll be able to learn some more about Hadrian's Wall together. I really hope you've enjoyed this short video and I look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Until then, safe journeys, keep well and speak soon. And for our audience today, what is it like to actually be there as you're walking along this architectural monument to history? What goes through your mind? What do you imagine? For me, um, just to give you an idea where I live in the northeast of England, I'm a mile and a half away from the line of Hadrian's Wall. And within a sort of three mile radius of where I live, there are still sections of the wall that you can see in the middle of you know, urban areas. So people's, there's actually in people's gardens. And it's just amazing to be able to walk beside it. And it's a part of our daily lives up here in Northern Britain. So when I walk alongside it, because I've done the reading, it's not just a, a bunch of stones concreted together to preserve them, which is what you'll see today. Is you know, they've been um, consolidated to ensure that future generations get to enjoy them. 
But for me, I can imagine it as it looked, you know, when it was nearly six meters high, you know, two and a half meters wide, with an impressive fortification all along northern Britain to, to separate the British Isles in half. But alongside that as well, you get into the more deeper parts of Hadrian's Wall, which is really fascinating because it's the troops on the wall, the human story that make it so interesting. These soldiers are drawn from all over the Roman Empire. The, the vast majority are from the Western Roman Empire. You've got Spaniards, you've got Gauls, you've got um, people who are Germanic in descent um, and Swiss all on the wall as well. But you've also got um, Croatians, you've got Romanians, um, Bulgarians. We also know that there were uh, Syrians and Iraqis also on Hadrian's Wall. So these guys are drawn from all over the empire. They're brought over here. They serve at least 25 years on the wall. They probably, if they don't return back to their home countries, marry, stay in the local area, have families, and then their sons or their daughters continue of the, the whole of the, the Hadrian's Wall frontier. So it's not just about this a military frontier. It's also about the human story, that social history of how this, this frontier transformed Britain from being a, um, a native British um, and within the, the context of this, I'd say, inverted commas, Celtic society to becoming a, a sort of a part of Rom Romano-British. And when people think of the Romans, you know, they think of Latin. But we know that there was the, the high Latin spoken, you know, in the Senate and in amongst emperors and that sort of stuff. But on the lower level as well, you've got vulgar Latin. And this is the local regional dialects that eventually would evolve into becoming languages like French, Spanish, Italian, Romanian. So those languages are the, the ones that are the descendants of Volga Latin. So in Britain, there would have been a Volga Latin in the British Isles. And that Volga Latin would have been common to all of the troops on Hadrian's Wall. And they would have also had their own words that they brought in from their home cultures. You could hear German words alongside uh, you know, Syrian words alongside Croatian or, well, Dalmatian, as they were known back then, all of those different dialects side by side. And it's, it just creates this whole new way of viewing Hadrian's Wall as this sort of melting pot of cultures under Rome, but then also how it interacts with a native British population and causes both conflict and, um, and cohesion together. And to my subscribers, once again, don't forget to check out the links in the video description below. Give him your entire support in helping him make history matter as he combines travel with education. We had a story of Hadrian's Wall, a place that would forever change Britain as we know it. And we have the stories of people all the way from Ethiopia to the Middle East and Europe a variety of peoples drawn to one island for one purpose. And thanks to preservation, historical sources, and the hard work of historians and archaeologists, their stories are still here for us to study today, even though it may be more complicated than we want to imagine. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much and have an excellent day.